Welcome to the grim dark of the Warhammer 40k universe, where the decaying Imperium of Mankind is beset on all sides by brutal monsters, swarms of unaccountable horrors, and fiends that defy comprehension. I'm Richard Siegler, two-time global champion of Warhammer, and I'm here to teach you how to play Warhammer 40k 10th edition using the core rules. If this is your first time playing Warhammer, your returning player from previous editions, or if learning how to play seems daunting, this is the video for you. The first step is to gather all things you will need to play a game of Warhammer 40k. The most important thing you'll need aside from an opponent are the core rules, which you can find for free on the Warhammer community website, or as a physical copy in the Leviathan starter box. You'll also need the following. A table or flat space that fits the size of your game. You're going to need terrain, ruins, craters, forests, or other things to represent them. You're also going to need two Warhammer 40k armies. See our How to Play Faction videos on our YouTube channel in the How to Play 10th Edition playlist. You're also going to need a tape measure and other measuring aids, a lot of dice, not just a single one, objective markers, and finally wound counters, which can be different colored dice or even beads. Now that you have everything you physically need to play, let's get you caught up on Warhammer vocabulary so you can best understand the core rules. Warhammer uses many terms in unique and important ways for understanding the base rules of the game. This section will detail several of these words and what they mean. Battles in Warhammer are resolved using dice. Dice are often referred to by the term D6, which is a fancy way of saying a six-sided die. Some instances will require rolling 2D6, which is simply rolling two six-sided dice together and adding the result. If the rule says roll a d3, you roll a normal d6 and then treat each result of a 1 or 2 as a 1, each result of a 3 or 4 as a 2, and a 5 or 6 as a 3. In other words, you simply half the result of the d6, rounding up. Often you will have to measure to see how far a warrior can travel or shoot. All measurements in Warhammer are made using inches with a tape measure. In order to determine if one model can see another, Warhammer uses true line of sight, in which you determine visibility from the perspective of your models. The base of a model is part of the model for visibility purposes. Individual models in Warhammer are often grouped together in units, and all of your units compiled together are referred to as your army. Your army is considered friendly, while your opponent's army is considered the enemy. Some units, like vehicles, monsters, and characters are made up of just one model. They are for every purpose still a unit. Every unit has a data sheet, which is the term for their unique rules and characteristics. These may seem daunting at first, I admit, but will soon become second nature as you play your army. Now let's break down a data sheet in more detail. Each data sheet has a set of keywords at the bottom that denotes the faction that the unit belongs to for your army roster, and a second set of keywords that allows the unit to interact with certain game-wide rules, army-specific rules, and stratagems. For now, don't worry too much about the keywords. The M stands for movement. Movement is a measurement in inches and determines how many inches a model can move. Toughness is a measurement of how durable a unit is. Save is a measurement of how easily a model can prevent taking damage. A model's wounds characteristic determines how much damage a model can suffer before being destroyed and removed from the table. Leadership is a test of how brave a unit is, and thus how likely it is to resist battle shock. OC is objective control. It determines how effective a model is at holding vital points around the battlefield. This is where you'll find a unit's ranged weapon. These weapons you use primarily in the shooting phase. This is where you'll find a unit's melee weapons, primarily used in the fight phase. Here you'll find a unit's unique abilities, which define how they interact with the battle. These are the core abilities, abilities that are common across many data sheets in the game. These are faction abilities, which units in your army will share. Some units have invulnerable saves, which will be denoted here. Now let's talk about unit coherency. Each multi-model unit can only finish any type of movement if it ends that move in coherency. 
For units of six or less models, this means that every model must be within two inches horizontally and five inches vertically of at least one other model in the unit. For units that contain seven or more models, each model must be within coherency of at least two other models instead. Engagement range is another term that refers to where models are placed on the battlefield. When one or more of your models is within one inch of any enemy models, it is within engagement range. This essentially refers to close combat. More on this later. Now that we understand some of the key Warhammer terminology, you will set up a battlefield with terrain, place objective markers, and deploy your armies. This video is designed to teach you about the core rules of 10th edition. So if you want to watch videos related to setting up a 40k table or deploying your army, check out our How to Play 10th Edition playlist. Head over to our mission video in the How to Play 10th Edition playlist to understand more about Chapter Approved Leviathan and how to claim victory. Let's begin our discussion of the core rules by looking at how a game is structured. A game of Warhammer 40k is made up of five battle rounds. Each battle round has two different player turns, one for yourself and one for your opponent. And finally, each turn has five key phases in which you and your opponent will play out a strategic battle of wits and decision making. In each of your player turns, you will activate all the units in your army, and then in each of your opponent's player turns, they will do the same. Let's imagine it is our player turn. We will navigate through a command phase, a movement phase, a shooting phase, a charge phase, and a fight phase in that order. The first phase of the game is the command phase. The command phase is a time to, number one, gain command points, which act as a resource, which you can spend throughout the game for powerful abilities. Two, grant abilities to other units from your leaders and generals. And three, to resolve battle shock tests. In a battle shock test, if any of your units have lost half or more of the models in their unit, or for single model units, if it has lost half or more of its starting number of wounds, you must take a battle shock test. Roll 2d6, and if the result is greater than the lowest leadership characteristic on your unit's data sheet, you pass the test. If you roll below their leadership characteristic, however, you fail. A unit that fails a battle shock test suffers several negative effects that last until the start of your next command phase. First, the unit that failed has its objective control characteristic changed to zero. Second, if the unit falls back, it must take a desperate escape test for every model in the unit. And third, the controlling player cannot use stratagems to affect that unit. We'll get to what all this means soon. For now, just be aware of failed battle shock tests. These are brutal negatives in the heat of battle. After the command phase comes the most important phase of the game, the movement phase. In the movement phase, you will select each unit from your army to make a type of move on the battlefield. Units can make one of four different types of moves. The most basic type of move is a normal move. This is where your models move from one part of the battlefield to another. Your models can move in any direction as long as no part of the model moves farther than their move characteristic in inches. A unit that needs to move quickly can make an advance. To make an advance, roll 1d6 and add that number to the move characteristic of the unit. This is how far the unit can move. Any unit that advances cannot shoot or charge in your player turn. Units within an engagement range of enemy models can either fall back or remain stationary. A unit that falls back cannot shoot or charge in your turn. Remain stationary is when no models in a unit make any kind of other move. When making any of these types of moves, models have some restrictions. A model cannot be moved through terrain. It must be moved up, over, or around terrain. A model can be moved over any friendly models as if they weren't there. An exception to this is large models, monsters, and vehicles. Friendly vehicles and monsters, two important keywords in the game, cannot be moved over other friendly vehicles and monsters. A model can never end over any enemy model and can't move within one inch during the movement phase. A fallback move, however, allows your models to move over enemy models, unlike the other kinds of moves. But when doing so, you must take a desperate escape test for any models that try. To take a desperate escape test, roll a d6 for every model taking a desperate escape test. 
and on one or two, that model is destroyed and removed from the table. Models with the fly keyword can perform normal moves, advances, or fallback moves over enemy models as if they were not there. They don't have to take desperate escape tests, and they can even move with an engagement range of enemy models in the movement phase, provided they complete their move outside of engagement range. Additionally, fly models that begin or end a move on terrain can measure distances through the air instead of having to measure up, over, and around. The final step of the movement phase is reinforcements, when units you have placed in deep strike or strategic reserve can enter the battlefield. That's a little more advanced, and we actually cover these topics in our own videos in the How to Play 10th Edition playlist. Now that movement is done, we're ready for shooting. The shooting phase is one of my personal favorites. Boy, do I love just doing crippling damage to my opponent with a lot of big guns. In the shooting phase, select units that are eligible to shoot and resolve their ranged attacks. You don't have to shoot with a unit if you don't want to, but why not? Let's say we're going to shoot with these Space Marine Intercessors. We then have to choose which weapon each model will shoot with. This can be found in your data sheet under the Weapon Profiles. Next, we select eligible enemy targets for our attacks by selecting any enemy units that have at least one model visible and in range of your own model. You do this by determining visibility at your model's level and using the range characteristic on your model's weapon found on their data sheet. Models with multiple weapons can shoot all of them at the same target or shoot different weapons at different targets. Note that some models in your unit may not be able to draw visibility and or range to any enemy models and thus will not be able to resolve any ranged attacks. Our intercessors are shooting at these Necron warriors. Once we have determined which models can shoot and checked range to their target, we can resolve our attacks. Find the attack's characteristic on the ranged weapon's profile and then make one hit roll for each attack. Our BS or ballistic skill will tell us what we need for our hit roll to be successful. In this case, our intercessor is equipped with a bolt rifle, which has two attacks and a BS of three plus. So any three, four, five, or six on our hit rolls will successfully hit our target. If you're shooting multiple weapons with the same profile, you can roll them all together for convenience. This is called fast dice. Different weapon profiles must be rolled separately, however. For all the attacks that successfully hit, we can then roll wound rolls and determine what we need to successfully wound, based on our weapon's strength characteristic and the enemy unit's toughness characteristic. To do so, we will consult the wound chart, which is used in both the shooting and fight phases, so it's very important that you know how to use it. If your weapon's strength is double the target unit's toughness, you wound on twos. If your weapon strength is more than their toughness, you wound on 3+. If it's equal to their toughness, you wound on 4+. If your weapon strength is less than their toughness, you wound on 5+. And finally, if your weapon strength is half or less than their toughness, you wound on a 6+. In this case, our bolt rifle is strength 4 against the warrior's toughness of 4, so we wound them on 4+. Once we have rolled successful wound rolls, our opponent then takes a saving throw using its save characteristic found on the data sheet. This is where the armor penetration characteristic, referred to as AP, can subtract that number from your opponent's saving throw. In this case, the Necron Warrior has an armor save of 4+, plus, and the Space Marine Bolt Rifle has the AP characteristic of 1. With AP 1, the Warrior's save is reduced from 4+, plus to 5+. Plus. Now only rolls of 5 or 6 successfully negate the damage. Once a save has failed, you will compare the damage characteristic of your weapon with the wounds characteristic of your opponent's model. If the damage is equal to or greater than the enemy model's wounds characteristic, that model is destroyed and removed from the table. If the damage is below their wounds characteristic, place a wound counter next to the model and subtract the damage of your ranged weapon from it. While the rules are written such that you resolve these attacks, wounds, and saves individually, one at a time. In practice, most players use fast rolling for weapons with the same profile. In such cases, all the hit rolls and then the wound rolls are rolled together in one batch. And then if the enemy models have the same save characteristic, the opponent will roll the saving throws together at once. All failed saving throws will then be allocated one wound at a time to models in the enemy unit. 
The only type of saving throw that ignores AP is invulnerable saving throws that are typically seen on characters and the toughest units in the game. At the end of this step, we will then select a new eligible unit from our army to resolve ranged attacks, and continue this process until all the units that can do so. This attack sequence, rolling to hit, rolling to wound, and then the opponent making saving throws, is the core mechanic for dealing and receiving damage in Warhammer, and will become second nature quickly as you become more familiar with the characteristics on your unit's data sheets. And that's the fundamentals of the shooting phase. Let's move on now to the charge phase. First, we select an eligible unit from your army who can make a charge move. A unit is eligible to charge if it did not advance or fall back, if it's not within engagement range of an enemy unit, or if it doesn't have the aircraft keyword. The selected unit can declare a charge against any enemy units within 12 inches as charge targets. They do not even have to be visible. Next, roll 2d6. This number is your charge roll and is a distance in inches. If moving your models up to your charge roll allows your unit to end that move with an engagement range of every unit you selected as a charge target, you successfully charged. If not, the charge fails and you cannot move this phase. When moving the models that successfully charged, be sure each model ends that move closer to one of the units selected as a charge target. If you can finish this move in base-to-base -base contact, you must do so. Most models interact with terrain just like it was the movement phase. Units with fly can charge over models as long as they land and end in coherency. They can even ignore measuring the vertical distance of terrain as long as they start their charge in terrain or end their charge move on terrain. When moving such units, you measure the distance from your starting position to where you can legally end your move. The core rules call this measuring through the air, as shown in this graphic. You repeat this process of selecting units and making charges until you are out of eligible units or you don't wish to charge. Once we're done charging, it's time for the fight phase. The fight phase is where the game gets really bloody as you come to grips with your opponent in close combat. In each player's fight phase, both players alternate selecting eligible units to fight one at a time, starting with the player whose turn is not taking place. Every unit that is eligible to fight must fight. Think of the fight phase in terms of stages. There is the fight first stage and the normal stage. First, both players take turns selecting units in the fight first stage, starting with the player whose turn is not taking place. Once all of the fight first stage units are resolved, players alternate selecting normal stage units, starting with the player who is not taking a turn, until all units have been selected. A unit is eligible to fight if it is within engagement range of one or more enemy units, or if it made a charge move this turn. No unit can fight more than once per phase. When activating an eligible unit to fight, they can first complete a pile-in move, in which each model can move up to three inches if it is not already in base-to-base -base contact with an enemy model. For a unit to pile in, it must be eligible to end these moves with an engagement range of one or more enemy units and incoherency. If they cannot do so, they cannot make a pile-in move. When performing a pile-in move, each model must end closer to the closest enemy model and move into base contact with one or more enemy models if they can. Only models within engagement range of an enemy unit or in base-to-base -base contact with another model from their own unit that is within base contact with an enemy unit can fight. Next, you will resolve your melee attacks. Unlike for ranged weapons, each model will select one melee weapon profile on their unit's data sheet to make attacks with. Using the attacks characteristic of the melee weapon, you will then declare up to that number of attacks on the targeted enemy unit. Or units. Resolve your hit and wound rolls following the formula from the shooting phase. Then your opponent will make saving throws in the same exact manner. Once all attacks and saves have been resolved and any enemy models have, have been destroyed or damaged, a unit can make a consolidation move. When doing so, you can move each model in that unit not in base contact with an enemy model up to three inches. 
Consolidate moves are one of the more complex movements in the game because you need to check several things before moving any of your models. Remember, you must always end any move with incoherency. First, you need to know if you can end your move with an engage range of at least one enemy unit. If you can, you can consolidate. If no, then you can check to see if you can consolidate three inches and end that move within range of an objective marker. If yes, you can then consolidate. If no, that unit cannot consolidate and you move on to the next eligible unit from your army. If you're able to consolidate a unit, a few conditions do apply. One, any of your models that end within base contact with an enemy model must do so. Two, if a unit is unable to make melee attacks because there are no enemy units within engagement range, it can still perform a consolidate move. Three, if your unit consolidates into an enemy unit that was not previously eligible to fight, that enemy unit can do so during the remaining combat step. And that's the end of the fight phase and your player turn. Your opponent will then begin their turn, starting with their command phase, and repeat this process until the end of battle round 5, at which point the player with the most points is the winner. Warhammer has additional rules governing unique weapon abilities, deployment, transport, strategic reserves, aircraft, terrain, and much, much more. For succinct breakdowns on these rules, please click the playlist on your screen for how to play 10th edition. Once you're familiar with the core rules, it's time to actually begin playing Warhammer. When you do so, the next step is to find a friend and set up a Warhammer battlefield. For videos on setting up a gaming space with appropriate terrain, mastering the declared battle formation step, and how to properly deploy your army, check out these other videos. Warhammer is a game of strategic and tactical depth, and there are many advanced rules and techniques to learn, different types of missions and game sizes, and beyond that, tournament match play that takes place globally with dozens of events every weekend. Whether you want to improve your own skills for friendly battles with your friends, or become the next world champion of Warhammer, the Art of War 40k community is the best place to learn Warhammer for everybody.